if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSURF5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSURF5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. This episode is sponsored by Apollo, a tool that's helping me to open doors and close deals faster. Wanted to share it with you. Apollo is a complete end-to-end sales platform, letting you email, dial, connect on social, build plays, and schedule meetings. With conversational intelligence, transcribing my calls lately, and reminding me to act on my next steps to drive deals across the finish line, it's been a lifesaver. It's no wonder Apollo is the most loved sales tool on the planet. Thousands of users rank Apollo as a top tool on G2. Start today completely free and see how Jesse and I use Apollo. Sign up in the show notes below or at thesalesplayers.com forward slash Apollo. That's thesalesplayers.com forward slash A-P-O-L-L-O to start your free trial. Hey, sales players. In today's episode, Jesse and I interview co-founder, of Zyra Talk, an AI platform, Bradley Scruggs. And in this conversation, we'll talk about how AI is not going to take your sales job yet. And we'll also talk about ways of building a company through different processes and really listen to Brad's story. I had a great time talking with Brad. And one of the funniest things is Brad was actually a prospect of mine that I prospected his company for a few months. And what I love is that we're able to take a cold call and turn it into a podcast episode. It's taken a little bit of time in between that to make that happen. Without further ado, here's the episode. Okay. And we're live today. We've got uh, Brad Scruggs on with us. Welcome, Brad. Great to be on. Yeah, we're happy to have you and super stoked that we got connected. So maybe a good starting point would be to just tell us a bit about yourself, uh, your career thus far. And then if you want to segue into what you're doing right now, that'd be awesome for our listeners. Yeah, for sure. I'll give a background on our company. Me personally, married. I have two kids. Our son's about to turn one. Uh, Been in the entrepreneur space for about seven years now. Uh, eight years now, maybe actually. Um, So been pretty involved and we've been scaling our company pretty successfully, which has been great. Uh, But a little background on our company, we started, like I said, about eight years ago with a different brand called Great Pros. And that product was basically connecting homeowners who needed a home service contractor. So if they needed a roof replaced, they needed a plumbing job, they could go on Great Pros and say what they needed. And we were essentially selling those leads to our contractor network. So we had over a thousand contractors. We were generating thousands of leads per month and it was good. But the thing is, it wasn't super scalable. You needed the contractor network. Um, You also needed to generate a ton of leads for them to be active and for them to be happy. So things happen in waves during the busy time. It was great because a lot of people were buying and it was easy to generate leads, but you know, during the shoulder seasons in the home service space, it was a little bit harder. So it wasn't as predictive or as predictable as the SaaS world. Um, so yeah, and I'll, I'll give kind of a background on how we got to Zyra Talk as well. So on the Great Pro side, we were spending a lot of money on Google Ads, millions of dollars to generate all of these leads. The margins were relatively thin. And we were always like, man, if we could increase our online conversions just by a fraction of a percent, that would be huge for our business. So everyone was doing form fills, you know, Home Advisor, Angie's List, Porch, all those other players in the lead gen space. And we were like, you know what, let's just try building a, a really basic chat 
on our site and just see what happens. So we built yeah. version 1.0 of Xyrotalk for ourselves. And at that point, it wasn't even called anything. So we got a pretty good amount of leads and we actually increased our online conversions pretty significantly. I mean, it wasn't like 10, 20% but it was like small number percentages where it's like, wow, with how much we're spending, this is a pretty good return. So we actually gave it away for free to some of our bigger clients here in Phoenix, like George Brazil, Chaz Roberts, still nice. clients of ours today. And yeah, they got great results. They loved it. The chats were great. At that time, it was not AI based. So it was just us analyzing the intent. So if someone was asking about uh, rescheduling a job, canceling an appointment, pricing, something like that. We were analyzing the intent or if they were just a lead, you know, we knew how to take them down that conversation flow. Now it's completely AI based. So mm. there's been a lot of uh, advancements in the last year and a half with all the LLMs, chat GPT. So we have an integration with chat GPT. We've tested a ton. They are miles ahead of everyone and it works out really well. So it's completely conversational on the chat side if someone goes to a website and they're having a conversation, it will be uh, it will feel like they're chatting with a human. So we've replicated this on the voice side now. When we started the company Zyra Talk, the name came from we want to help customers, help clients how they talk to their customers, whether it was chat or voice. The technology on the voice side just wasn't there yet. It sounded very robotic. It um, it wasn't very conversational. Now with some of the advancements on the AI side and also the AI and replicating voices, it sounds very human-like, sounds like you're talking to someone. And Chase, I know you've heard a lot of recordings. I don't know if we have any recordings we could play here, uh, but it works out extremely well. So we have a lot of clients using that. We've had thousands and thousands of calls be handled by AI at this point. And clients love it. There's some clients who are getting 60 to 70 calls per day that are handled by AI. And that's just for overflow. So uh, I'll keep going a little bit and I want to yeah. get your guys' thoughts here, but our initial, do, you have, do you have a question before I keep going? Yeah, maybe. I think something that might be helpful is just give us a quick, what's a quick use case for installing this? Is this more for support teams or is this for sales teams or is it for following up with leads? Yeah, great question. And, and that's where I was going next. So okay, cool. our initial thinking was, you know, this is going to be great for after hours and overflow. And mm -hmm. it is. So a lot of clients, that's what they use it for. If someone is calling in the middle of the night, a lot of home service companies, and that's our biggest vertical. So I'll say home services a lot. A lot of home services, they don't have an after hours call center. So if they're getting a call in the middle of the night, some people have CSRs that are rotating. Some people have technicians that are rotating in the middle of the night. After talking to a lot of our customers, the reality is they are just not answering the phone at two in the morning. They're going to sleep through that call and it's just not going to get answered. Mm -hmm. There are companies who have a call center and if they're going to call at two in the morning, chances are it's an emergency job. There's water leaking out of the wall or maybe there's a big sewer problem. So those are super valuable calls that they want to be responding to. Every home service company that I've talked to, they do not like their call center. They'll pronounce the name of the company wrong. They'll say the dispatch fee is wrong. Yeah. It's it's a necessary evil for these companies, but most of them are not a big fan of their call center, but it does get a return on investment. So that's where we come in. It's a better experience for the customer. They're not on hold. You know, the the company can choose how long the customer the phone is ringing. Yeah. Um but if it's in the middle of the night, it'll go to the AI right away. So a lot of benefits cool. gets a huge return on investment. I'll stop there. I know I, uh, I know I gave a lot of information, so I want to get some questions from you guys and obviously I could keep going. Yeah, it was a, it was a great overview. It was good to hear the, the background. I've got a bunch of questions. I'm trying to think where I should start. So first would be you're the co-founder of the company and Tell us maybe a little bit about what goes into starting a company like Zyra Talk. Let's go all the way back to the the early days. And you, you told us a little bit about the pivot from from what you were doing. Yep. But what yeah, what kind of uh, and most specifically, what our listeners I think will get a lot out of is how did you go to market and what was the first round of conversations like with potential customers? It sounds like you had a free offering, but tell us maybe a little bit about how you put together the messaging and did the outreach and started to sort of build that that pipeline of potential customers and ultimately customers? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and I'll back up to the great pros days because 
Yeah. I mean, we started with literally nothing. So we didn't have any contractors in our network. We didn't have any leads. It was literally me, Brian, and Ahmad picking up the phone all day for months, cold calling contractors, asking, hey, do you need more leads? And it's not an easy thing to do. So us three, we yeah. were salespeople, number one, two, and three. And getting your hands dirty and making phone calls is, in my opinion, one of the best things you can do as a founder early on. You know, later on in the business, you you know, you delegate things to people. But still, I like to get on client calls. I like to do a little bit of cold calling just to get my feet wet, see what people are saying. And it's a very educational for a, a founder to do that sort of thing. Yeah. What were some early insights that you discovered in doing that and picking up the phone and, and reaching out to potentials? What were some light bulb type moments where you thought, hey, there we're onto something here or yeah. the market seems to want this and not that? Well, here's the funny thing. On the chat side with the AI chat in the beginning, people would literally be like, you're going to put a robot on my website? Is that even going to work? Does that even make sense? And we were like, yeah, we're doing it for some really large clients. It, you know, just give us a shot, test it out. You know, some people we'd say, hey, we'll let you try it for free for a week. And if it doesn't work, take it off your site, you know, no harm, no yeah. foul. And then wow. now these days we're in 2024, people are asking, how do I automate everything? The question of a robot on my website is not a thing. It's like, yeah, I have a live chat company and, you know, the hold times are 30 seconds or a minute. And I don't want that at all. I want instant responses, instant answers for my customers and it's the same thing for voice. About one in four customers, we lead with the use case of after hours and overflow for their calls. But about 25% of people are like, can this just be the first line of defense for when people are calling the company? Or maybe it kicks yeah. in after like 10 seconds because they don't want their customers at, on hold at all. So we've seen a huge shift with people and how it's receptive in the market. Uh, so that's been a, a pretty interesting learning. Brad, would you say you're bullish on AI or do you feel like it's going to take your job as a founder? I mean, what what are your thoughts on the controversial uh, thoughts on AI? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question because some people who are like, oh, you guys are taking a bunch of jobs, replacing people. In some cases, yes, it does happen. But at the end of the day, for the CSR world or people who are doing customer service on the phones, it's the best CSRs are going to stay at the end of the day. It's a, a position that has a very high attrition rate. Uh, we were talking to a call center the other day. They, lo they lose 25% of their employees every year. So one out of four people, are they're gone at the end of the year. So the life cycle of a CSR is pretty low. Yeah. And for home service companies, what we're telling them, if they're saying, oh, man, we could get rid of a CSR, our advice to them is why don't you transition them to be dispatchers? Because becoming a dispatcher in this, the home service space, that's a higher paying position. It's yeah. someone who already knows about the company. And at the end of the day, we just feel like people are going to be transitioned into higher value tasks rather than being a, a human voicemail. Love that. And would you say that your solution is helping both the uh, small trades people that maybe have one one owner, solopreneur, that they have their own shop, they're a plumber, they're an HVAC company, all the way up to a 50 truck, 100 truck uh, platform? Is it for everybody or is it just for a specific? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say it can be for everybody, but the reality is with these smaller companies, it's they're not getting as many phone calls. They're not really getting traffic on their website for chat to really be valuable for them. So we try to play in the, the space of larger companies, at least like five to 10 trucks. But we obviously work with some home service companies with over 100 trucks doing 100 million a year. So it, it works a lot better for the bigger companies, but it can work for smaller companies. A use case for the smaller companies would be like restoration or roofing, where you know, the owner is on a lot of the jobs, but these are jobs that can be fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So um, they don't want to miss any phone calls. We have a, it's funny, we have a roofing client. They do 15 million a year. Guess how much or how many phone calls they miss, the percentage. I think you would be shocked. Like 25% of their calls. 
It's like 65, 70%. Whoa. And the only people who guess that number correctly are people who are in the call center space. <laughs> I'm in the call center space and I didn't get it right. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's okay. But I, that, that's that's okay. insane. So, cause, cause when I think about that, like the quantity of that is, is astronomical because if, if every one of those people calling is a potential lead or, uh, you know, a customer project or something like that, and they're missing, was it 65%? Is that what you said? Yeah. They're missing 65% of the people trying to flag them down for something. Then they're leaving. You probably, they could probably quantify what, what the dollar figure that they're just flushing down the toilet is. Oh yeah. I mean, at that point, if you're answering all of those calls and setting the expectation with the customer that they're getting booked for an appointment, or maybe they're just leaving a message. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the business could double overnight. It just comes down to getting good people after that. So Brad, while we're talking oh, about, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So oh, yeah. So Brad, I have a question. You know, we, I was prospecting into uh, Zyra Talk. I don't know when I first met you all. It was a, probably a year and a half, two years ago uh, when I was with What Converts. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about learning more about your platform was how you all used a white label solution and also partnering with other agencies to help distribute your SaaS product as well as having affiliate types of programs. So I'd love to learn more about how you and your brother and the other co-founder have used these strategic partnerships to help grow your business and just give people sort of the high level uh, playbook of what you would look into doing of creating partnerships. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the reality for us is on the chat side, there's, quite a bit of competition on the voice side. There are very few right now, especially in the home service space. But, you know, on the chat side, partnerships made a lot of sense because if we're going to a random home service company direct there, there's no credibility. There's no connection. It's just desire talk. Okay. Never heard of you guys on to the next one. But when we go to marketing agencies or some of these other partners, you know, there's next star. Uh, there's some of these other big groups like Nextstar as well. And when you're calling someone and you're like, hey, I'm a Nextstar vendor. Uh, we've been a partner of theirs for three, four years. Then there's that credibility and association like, oh, they're with Nextstar. Or, hey, you know, yeah. we're partnered with XYZ Marketing Agency. Then they're like, oh, you know, Joey sent you here and he had to give me a call. So yeah, then there's that affiliation. So leading with a partnership and giving some sort of rev share to the partner, obviously it's a win for them. But we'll still do the sales process and we'll still handle all of that, all of the support, all the onboarding. So just us having that affiliation and leading with someone is worth giving a chunk uh, of the deal with a rev share because it's a lot easier for us to close deals and scale the company. And a lot of our partners, they'll feed us deals as well. So we've got a, we have a call center partner right now. They're onboarding 85 accounts in uh, the next two months. So they're going to be doing 10 a week. And yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great relationship. They get a win, they, they get a better, better experience for their customers and they get a rev share out of it. So it's a win-win for everyone. And just to let the listeners know, Nextstar is a plumbing trade organization. So basically it's a vetted organization for plumbers that they have to be vetted in and it's a coaching program so it, it really is one of those organizations that plumbers and HVAC companies trust. And so if you're a vendor from that, it, you just use that trust value from that. For sure. Yeah. And the the members of Nextstar, I know they pay a membership per year and they also get a small rebate from our product. So there's there's a lot of value in it. How did you come up with the the partner model? Was that just kicking around ideas for how to scale your your revenue growth and just thought, hey, why are we not, why are we trying to pound the pavement when we could maybe go into, like you said, a contact center partner or uh, a resale partner or something like that, that can just put your product in front of the right person and channel that sale back to you all? How did you yeah, come up with that idea? That's a really good question. And the way we think, you know, people say R&D, re- um, research and development, R&D to us is research and duplicate. So when we're researching companies, seeing how they scale, you know, our thinking is always, how do we tax the business? So years ago, we were researching HubSpot, or I think Ahmad was my other partner. 
And HubSpot grows a lot through channel partners. So they have all of these HubSpot partners and they're getting people to use the HubSpot CRM. They get a kickback for it and they help onboard the client to HubSpot. So we were like, man, if we could do that with some sort of audience, that would be great for us. And it was marketing agencies because for us, one of the challenges on the chat side was getting it on the website. Now we're to the point where anytime we close a deal, we're getting on the website 95% of the time. There's very few cases where we don't get on the site. And part of that was the marketing agency controls the website. So at some point we were like, we're going to have to talk to the marketing agency. So why don't we just give them a cut of some of these deals? It's a lot faster from an onboarding perspective. And they also have this ecosystem of customers who we can start penetrating. So that was the thinking there in it's been a it's been a win for us. Yeah, it's super cool. I, I th- and I personally think that what you're doing is is the future of go to market. I think companies that are adopting something similar to this are winning. Uh, and I'm not by any means saying cold calling's dead and cold outreach is dead. I think you should do some of that also. Yeah. But I also believe that if you can get smart about targeting who your ICP is. Uh, where they might be, not just in terms of platforms and channels, but they're probably spending money on similar services. They they may have a contact center already, and if you can partner with that contact center, you're you're it's a faster way to get in front of that person, and it's more of a it's much more of a warm intro because it's a trusted partnership, and it's hey, we're recommending you go look at Zyra Talk because they're our partner. We've worked with them for a long time. We wouldn't recommend them if we didn't think they had a good product. So I really think what you guys are doing is yeah. very innovative in terms of where, you know, I think when we look back five, six, seven, maybe even less time frame than this, but when we look back in a few years, I think we're going to see that the way to scale a technology company or a services company is going to be through building these really strong channel partnerships and alliances. And I think, uh, yeah, very commendable. You guys came up with that and you seem to be way ahead of the curve. <laughs> Appreciate that. And you know, you say that it's also understanding the pain points of the marketing agency. Because yeah. for some people, it's like, oh, a rev share on a couple hundred bucks a month. It doesn't move the needle for them. But on the voice side, what we're seeing is we talk to these marketing agencies and obviously they're talking to their customers every single day. And they're saying, yeah, we generate all of these leads and our customers are not answering the phone. So now when we go to a marketing agency, it's like, hey, have them use this AI voice product so that you can show the value of your agency and all of the leads you're generating. Now everyone's like, wow, my customers have to use this. So there's some agencies who are paying for it on behalf of their clients because they see it more of a retention tool because of how many leads they're generating. And then there's other people who are saying, you know, it's bundled into your package or you have to pay for this uh, with yeah. any new account. So it's been it's been a pretty interesting thing. What are some surprising things that you and your co-founders have learned in the last 18 months about your customers, about the business, about the business world in general, anything that that you can share with us as far as learnings? learnings. Yeah, the shift of how receptive people are to using AI. And I'm on all of these, I'm in these Facebook groups specific for home services, and everyone's talking about AI, everyone's talking about how they can automate their processes And that's been really interesting. And like I said, one out of four people are like, can this just be my first line of defense for when people call the company? That was a shock to us because when we were going to market, we actually have a call center partner who uh, someone can pay for our AI and they can also pay for the human backup on the, for a call center. So we were going to market thinking this is going to be an AI plus human play and the very interesting realization is people are saying we want this just to be the AI play and how we can automate everything. So that's been, uh, that's been pretty cool to see. Brad, talk to me about some learnings of making the shift from the lead gen agency to Zyra talk. Do you all still have the lead gen gen agency? And what was that conversation of, Hey, let's put this behind and let's go a hundred percent on Zyra talk. When did you all make that decision? Yeah, it was it was a slower transition. It, the revenue in the SaaS world, as you guys know, it's subscription based. It's very predictable. So, mm-hmm. I mean, for us, I could tell you what we're probably where we're probably going to be in three months from now, based on our growth rate, based on deals in the pipeline, based on our churn. In the lead gen world, 
that was not a thing. It's like, oh man, I hope we make X amount next month based on how many leads we generate. Hopefully our contractor network is wanting to purchase these leads. So it wasn't as predictable, but when the revenue caught up on the Zyra side, we were like, okay, we got to start phasing out great pros and not even put any focus on that because it's just a business that is hard to scale. And, you know, and from a value standpoint, the multiples for a lead gen business are one X revenue versus, right. uh, you know, in the SaaS world where it's much higher. Will you actually, so we've had a, a slew of really great guests that are either founders or business owners. And one thing that I've always wanted to talk about more on the show is that exact thing you just said, which is what is it that makes a, a software company so much more valuable than a service company or a lead generation company or other type of product? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the things is the, um, what is it? The gross margins on the product. Mm -hmm. Our margins are extremely high just on the product. So if we didn't have any people, you know, anyone, our margins are upwards 85, 90%. And that's 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 because, you know, you build the product once and you can resell instances of that same product over and over again without a lot of incremental development on top of that. Is that right? Yeah. And that's how it is for all SaaS companies. I mean, I'm sure HubSpot and all these CRMs are operating at these extremely high gross margins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have a bunch of people. So most SaaS companies you see are not profitable, but they're growing. And it's because if they wanted to, they could get rid of everyone and be extremely profitable and just be printing money. But you want to continue to invest in that growth. So when you see these multiples, it's because companies have these very high growth rates. They have really good margins. And yeah, if they wanted to, they could just be a a cash cow. Yeah. I guess the other thing I've heard too from founders is there's a little bit of an innovation curve too. You know, if you're building a, a service business or a lead gen business, it's not necessarily an innovation thing. Whereas if you're building a software that does something that very few other softwares can do, And it's, you know, you're doing what it sounds like your team is doing, which is implementing new technology into it all the time, like AI, then there's this, this kind of growth and innovation curve that can, you know, what 10 X the multiple, maybe not 10 X the multiple, but that's where you see these like seven, eight, nine, 10% or 10 X multiples, uh, up to what I've seen, I've heard as high as like 15. Oh yeah. There's probably been companies that have been sold for even bigger multiples than that. Like. There yeah. are public SaaS companies who are being traded at 40, 50 X the revenue. And it's, it's crazy. It's because they have these high growth rates. I know like Datadog, for example, yeah. they're publicly traded and they're traded at, I think at one point they were over hundred X multiple, you even see wow. companies like Tesla. I mean, they're a car company, but if you look at their revenue versus what their market cap is at one point, I think they were a thousand X and it's like, how are companies getting these valuations because they're growing people believe in it and it's, it's, it's a good company. And is Zyra talk venture backed or are you guys fully bootstrapped? We are bootstrapped. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, that's so a rare thing in software. It is a rare it's thing. Really rare. <laughs> people don't see the, the hard part for the first few years. I mean, we didn't pay ourselves for a year and a half, two years. And wow. when we finally were, it wasn't a lot. And then now we're at the point where, you know, we're, we're comfortable, but you know, we don't want to be comfortable. So we're still scaling the business, uh, investing in marketing, investing in our team. So that's what we're, what we're looking to do. I, I imagine a lot of that, the, the reason you you bootstrapped or you were able to bootstrap is a lot like they say, I think MailChimp was one of those companies where the, the guys at MailChimp first had an agency, uh, that was doing content or websites or whatever. And then they used the proceeds, they kind of cash floated the proceeds from those services projects into building something that was more scalable, you know, MailChimp, the software. Is that yeah. more or less what happened? Is that how you guys made that transition from yeah. a lead agency to SaaS company? Very, yeah, very similar. I mean, we were generating leads and, you know, you want to say, oh, this is a SaaS product because it's being distributed on this platform. But at the end of the day, it was just lead gen and marketing. It wasn't a SaaS company. So then when you transition using the, you know, using the profits to build something that's actually a SaaS company, that's definitely one way to do it as founders. 
but you got to be willing to get your hands dirty and be ready to live off of savings and not pay yourself for a while. Yeah. And Brad, I know that you all are in Phoenix, Arizona. What has the uh, tech scene look like in Phoenix, Arizona? Are you in a tech group? Like who are your mentors? How do you connect with other? I, I don't know the Arizona team. I'm in, I'm in uh, Kentucky. So would love yeah. to learn more about that. Yeah. I mean, we could be a lot more involved than what we are. We had an office and we used to go to all these events. There was Phoenix Startup Week. We'd go to that for the whole week. Now our whole team, we're all remote. We all work from home. And we haven't been as involved as maybe we should in these groups or these tech groups. We're pretty focused on just scaling the business. And yeah, I mean, maybe we should get involved in some of these these groups. Yeah, fellow Arizonan here. What's interesting about the Phoenix area, and by the way, for the listeners, I think it's a really underrated place. And hopefully, Brad, you agree with me on that front. Oh, uh, I've lived here my whole life, and okay. I, mean, I don't know if I'd move. So I was here, grew up here, moved to Austin for about a decade, and just came back in the middle of the pandemic to be closer to family and and just needed a change. And it's been a good move back. The reason I left in the first place was because there wasn't at the time I left, there wasn't as many people like Brad building cool products and companies in Phoenix. And I wanted to go work for a startup. So I moved to Austin, did that for a bunch of years and then came back. What's really cool about the Phoenix area. And I imagine this is the case for your business is there's a huge contact center footprint here. So a lot of major companies have their remote offices in the Phoenix area. I believe that's partially because of our time zone. Part of the year, yeah. we're on mountain time. Part of the year, we're on Pacific. And it gives us that ability to serve the entire country. Uh, so if you're in a you know contact center or you're on a support team, you can take calls pretty early in the morning for East Coast. And then you can take calls in the afternoon for West Coast. But also, there's not a lot of natural disasters here. We don't have big earthquakes. We don't have tornadoes here. Uh, so if you're you know parking servers or something, Phoenix has been a good spot for that. And if you don't want your team to be offline because of an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado, Phoenix is also pretty good for that as well. Yeah. So tons and tons of contact centers here. If you look around on LinkedIn at some of the biggest brands, you'll notice that their customer service leaders or support team leaders tend to be in the Phoenix and Tempe area, which is pretty cool. So I think where you're building seems to be in the right spot. What I would ask is, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages to building a company in, in the Phoenix area? I don't know if, I mean, I don't think there's any disadvantages necessarily. Some people would argue that and be like, oh, if you're in the Bay Area, you have all of these connections and you could network much better. But we live in a digital world. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and I can get in contact with those people if I want to. And it's, I don't think there's really any disadvantages or advantages. It's more so who's the team and how willing are, how hard are they willing to work and are they going to be smart with it and be efficient? So as far as growing a company in Phoenix versus Austin or the Bay area, I think at the end of the day, it's just going to come down to the team. The one disadvantage maybe would be the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, hold on. All good. We can cut this part out too, by the way. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> no we're, cuts. We're we just go with it. <laughs> All right. We can go with it too. <laughs> no, either way. Um, just the vibe in general. I mean, yeah. people in in Phoenix, I talk to some other founders here. I'll meet in person with people. And it, compare that to somewhere in like the Bay Area or even yeah. like the East Coast where it's go, go, go. People get a little too comfortable here, I think. Mm-hmm. And that's what we always say. Like, we don't want to get too comfortable. We want to continue to grow. Um, so yeah, it, it, again, at the end of the day, it just comes down to the team though. That's a really interesting insight. And when I moved from Arizona to Austin, I remember noticing that right off the bat, I walk into a restaurant and there's like people at a table talking about their next round of funding. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Like, th- this is, yeah. this is a lot. And that's not even New York. I imagine being in New York or the Bay area or something like that. It's, you can't walk into a coffee shop without hearing someone pitch their idea for something or trying to sell a big software contract or whatever. And because Arizona is so spread out to the, the, I shouldn't say Arizona, the Phoenix area is really spread out. Uh, it makes it a little bit tougher to network. 
if you're True. 45 minutes away. Luckily, our freeway system is a lot more uh, efficient, I'd say, than a lot of you know California, Texas, and some other places. Oh, it's pretty sure. fast to get somewhere, but it still takes some time because of the the sprawl. But uh, yeah, this, this is very, you know, I'm glad Chase, you brought that question up because I was, I was totally going to ask the same thing. Like, what's it like building a company in the Phoenix area versus building on one of the coasts or in Texas or someplace like that? Yeah. And I think, like you said, Phoenix is a great place to live. I've been here my whole life and I've been to the East coast. I've been to a bunch of different States and I'm always like, man, the only bad thing about Phoenix is it's hot for three months, but I mean, you just yeah. stay inside or go do something indoors. Go visit Colorado during that time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Brad, one one last question question for me. Uh, so, the the three co founders, your brother and then Ahmad, you guys come from tennis, and you guys yes. all actually play tennis on a professional college level. Um, oh wow! They 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 did, and I would love to know what did you take from tennis that you could put into your SaaS company? Like where, where do those intersect and things that you could tell some of our listeners to look for? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in tennis, if you're playing singles, it's just you against someone else. So you can't blame your team. You can't, you just have to rely on yourself and work for yourself. And there was a study that I remember reading or hearing and it, it was something about tennis players being very successful because they have that understanding that they need to work for themselves. They can't just rely on their team. Obviously we have a team and, you know, we've all grown together, but there is that sense of independence, which I think is valuable. Awesome. Yeah. Now it's all about pickleball. (laughs) I was going to say that uh, tennis is still supposed to be a really great way to get in shape though. So I've, I, I don't think tennis is completely dead, but I know pickleball is very hot right now. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Pickleball is fun. So Brad, and just in closing, uh, if you had to share one piece of advice for somebody out there on the front lines, who's working on their next big deal, or maybe trying to scale their side hustle or just trying to hit quota so they can make it another year in this business, what uh, advice would you share? My advice would be, that whatever you're doing, whether you're in a sales role or trying to start a company, it's, I always say this to people, it's going to be a roller coaster of emotions. There's, there's these high highs where you sell a big deal, but there's also the low lows where a bigger client cancels. And it's like, oh man, that was a, that was one we really wanted to keep. So whether you're on a high high right now and you're scaling quickly, or you're on a low low trying to make things work, try to keep a pretty level, uh, level sense of emotion because that's what's going to get you through the high highs and the low lows just to continue to to keep pushing. So that's what I try to tell people. It's going to be a roller coaster of emotion. But if you can get off of the roller coaster and just stay as a flat line straight through, uh, it, it tends to help pretty well. Love that. Tell us where, for, for the listeners out there who might want to connect with you or learn more about the company, where can uh, folks find you? Yeah, you can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Uh, Bradley Scruggs is my full name. Or you can shoot me an email, brad at zyrotalk.com or just go to zyrotalk.com and you know you can fill out a form or you can chat with us and ask for a demo. Love awesome. it. Thank you so much, Brad. This was a lot of fun. And uh, I promise that we did talk to Brad. This is not AI, uh, you know, because a lot of times Brad will show you'll you'll hear his voice as an ai on the website which i i I want everybody to (laughs) check it out it's awesome we'll link to that say that chase because when people hear an of an ai voice product and right away they're thinking oh it's going to sound super robotic to be honest you cannot tell whether it is a robot or a human we i always share a recording uh, of a real call with one of our clients where the guy's like am i talking to a person or is this ai right now and then wow. the AI responds and it's like, hey, you know, this is an AI assistant, but all of our operators are busy right now. So we can make the voice sound like any of our clients if we want to or if they want to, small upcharge. But yeah, it's, uh, it's some pretty crazy stuff. How do you do that? Is it just like if, if I were the leader of a support team or something and I wanted my voice, you would ju- I just have me record a bunch of words or something? Or how does that work? We, 
yeah, we give them about a two minute script and it's got random words in there. Like we quest to be the best company, blah, blah, blah. So (laughs) it has those different pronunciations so that it can understand everything. I mean, it's almost like a tongue twister when you're reading it. But once they get through that two minute script, there's some things that we do on our end with uh, one of our partners to make it sound exactly like them. Wow. Brad, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, We're excited to see Zyra Talk continue to grow and look forward to being part of your network. And uh, yeah, everyone who's listening, go check out what they're building over at Zyra Talk. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. And uh, uh, this was a lot of fun.